My name is Okami Okavai. I'm going to be the moderator. I'm the moderator for the um, for this module four training. So welcome once okay. again to the drug information specialist training module four. Okay. We're going to start with an opening prayer. So we just have an opening a, a one minute opening prayer. Amen. Our speakers will be speaking for fifteen minutes each and then we'll have a question and answer session. I'm going to start by introducing our speakers. Our first speaker is Professor Bola Olaiwola. He's a neuropharmacologist and a clinical pharmacist at the Department of Clinical Pharmacy, uh, Pharmacy and, Admin, and Administration, Faculty of Pharmacy, Obafemi Abolowo University, Ileife. Our second speaker is a pharmacist. Ibrahim Abbas. Our third speaker is Dr. Mohamed Lawal. He works at the pharmacy department of the Federal Medical Center, Lukuja. Um, we welcome you, sirs, to this to our training, and we thank you for um, your presence here. So we're going to um, just quickly, um, I want to just take the opportunity to rec recognize everybody here. You are um, all welcome to the um, training, the training session. And um, we hope you um, get a lot of um, you, uh, benefit from attending this training. Thank you. So we're going to kick off with this first speaker, Professor Bola Olaiwala a neuropharmacologist and clinical pharmacist at the Department of Clinical Pharmacy and Administration, Faculty of Pharmacy of Bafemi Awolowo University. Professor Olaiwala, welcome. The floor is yours. Yeah, good evening, colleagues. Yeah, today we want to talk in continuation of the drug information you know, series. We want to expose ourselves to some of the key issues in drug information. And uh, as we know that in clinical pharmacy, one thing is very, very central, and that is the information component. So when we're talking of drug information, whatever the level of knowledge that one may possess, if it is not communicated appropriately, it's a waste. That's why the emphasis is on drug information. Now, drug information itself has many components. By the way, I'm to introduce the topic. The other two colleagues will take it in lead, you know, like a relay race. So in terms of introduction, there are so many components to drug information. There is the acquisition of that information. There is the dissemination of the information. And there is the utilization of that information. All those three components can be deepened and widened to the extent that people may specialize in some of these aspects or the uh, micro aspects. To that extent, I will address two issues or two central poles. You know, in our profession, we have the academic, we have the hospital, we have the community, the industry. More often than not, the academia they are familiar with information, both utilization, acquisition, and whatever. The industry also utilize, you know, to a large extent, you know, the information services or the information component. The community and the hospital are two arms that are sitting on a lot of data and they are 
they feel comfortable because they are information that are not utilized. And if we go out from this evening to be sensitized or stimulated to do what is needful, then we are turning pharmacy around for the better. Now, what are those key things? Everybody knows that for optimization of therapy to a patient, you just don't give the patient the, the drug. If it's not followed by a word, the patient may not you know, benefit. That is what we are interrogating tonight. By that we deepen it, we will all, you know, be grateful that the other now information, drug information, you know, from the, the, the motherboard, as I will call it, that is the uh, the information as a subject, as a noun. So drug information essentially, you know, takes root from the definition of information as it may be. So there are, as it regards, as regards uh, clinical pharmacy information or informatics, we have some basic tenets. When you face a patient, you have to, as of necessity, assess the clinical status of that patient. After assessing the clinical you know, status, now you have to ask some jamming questions about the clinical status of the person. The, the clinical questions we guide you know, into acquisition of evidence of more information, concrete information about the case or about the patient as the case may be. Then this body of evidence, you have to appraise it. In that appraiser lies the tool that you will eventually use to the benefit of the patient, okay? Because you have to apply everything that you that you have onto the patient. So we are clear on these five A's. Assess the clinical you know, problem, uh, ask germane or relevant clinical questions, acquire evidence, you know, then appraise the evidence and now turn it to apply that evidence you know, to the scenario or to the case. Now, all this that we have said, uh, they may look straightforward, but there are systematic ways of getting at all the components of this. And there is no how you will talk about, you know, uh, information, drug information, clinical information, without you know, setting out are the tools, how you acquire it or how you can actually, you know, do this. There is nobody that will not need to read. Indeed, uh, a pharmacist that does not read in a day, as we will say that day. So, and what are we to read? We, are, we all agree that the li literature inserts, the leaflets, that accompany drugs are, are short on, on details where the uh, information is neither here nor there, you know, they may uh, deepen it to their advantage. At times, some of the things that, like, if we are talking of issues of side effects, they may just say uh, people who are hypersensitive so this drug may not take it. What are those things that will make you to be hypersensitive? Is a pharmacist, 
you know, that we ask German questions. Have you ever taken this particular drug or drugs in the same family before? It is not from there that you will know what type of information, you know, to pass, you know, across. Now, again, when we're talking of information, the information uh, most of the times come from journals. And the journals, uh, they, they follow a format so that we should also know. In fact, anything that we are doing, if it's not documented, it's never done. And that stems from the clarification of sources of information. You know, there are basic scientific uh, researches that actually may not reflect clinical scenario. However, it is the stepping stone. It is the beginning where you latch on onto the clinical information that you may need. What this is saying is that you have to ground yourself in the systematics of basic research, particularly how journals are organized. We all know from our B farm or farm B project that it follow a, a systematic that is currently unbending. You start with the title. The title will follow will be followed by the authors, and in in talking about authors, the principal investigator is expected to come first. And the mentor, the mentor is supposed to come last. So that when you when you hold a journal, the person whose name appears first is supposed to be the principal investigator. Why the person that looks like the clearing house? The person who is the clearing house for the publication should come last because it's on his shoulder that everybody is standing to be visible. That is the agreed or the accepted norm about publication. Now, after the authors, then you have the title. The title must be coincise and address you know, the subjects of the journal or of the reading. Then after the uh, title, then you have the abstract, which is a super summary of all of the paper, so that if somebody does not have the benefit of reading the whole paper, once he reads the abstract, he will be able to make a decision whether to still read the article further or to stop at that, because everything should you know, be espoused by the abstract. In other words, the abstract is a summary of the introduction of the methodology of the results of the discussion and possibly conclusion. Now, when we have this at the back of our mind, there are definite questions that each of these sections should answer. You will wonder that we are going into research, you know, exactly from, from the point where we are coming from, because we are talking of information. How do you acquire information without reading? And what you read, you know, should be digested and regurgitated for the advance, I mean, for the benefit of our patients. So that's why I have to mention about this. My other two colleagues will deepen, you know, some of this. I expect them to, to deepen it because I've been in touch with uh, at least one of the two, and uh, I'm sure he's doing a great work. Now, you may ask why initially I said something about the hospital and you know, the community, because ordinarily they are not accountable because their promotion is not predicated on writing papers. If we find people 
who do this is out of passion or out of expectation, you know, to cross the line. However, the clinical pharmacy engagement has pointed or has shown us that we should not assume, you know, that we are not accountable. If for anything, uh, the affiliated universities or research institutes that are proximal, you know, to these hospitals can benefit such that there will be a sort of collaboration again for the benefit of our patients. So the hospital, the community, the two arms are sitting on a lot of data. By the time we deepen it, you know, the mode of collection of those data, you know, will be espoused. And therefore we know that from there, it is um, forward ever. Now, I will talk briefly about that. Um, there are there are some some things that should form inform the information that you require and the information you are giving a particular drug to somebody who is naive. You, as a matter of duty, require to ask about the age of the patient. Of course, you can assume gender if you know that it's the person who wants to use it that is before you. Because some people ask, uh, they send errands. They send people on errands to acquire medications for them. So you need the age, you need the gender. Of course, you can easily determine you know, uh, the, the race or ethnicity of the person and uh, ask a few questions about individual, you know, differences or idiosyncrasies. If we are equipped with all this information from the patient, then you can, you can know if somebody itches to pass it down, for instance, you know, the Johnson syndrome, and the person will take any of the saponamides such that you know that if he reacts to something that have uh, sulfamethoxine, you know, all other drugs that are sulfur based have to be excused. You know, those are things that we should interrogate. Those are the final you know, points of use or the point of use of some of this information that you know, we are uh, interested in. As a matter of fact, you know, when, when you have all this data, the transmission of your finding must follow an accepted you know, pattern. And those accepted patterns are also guided by a lot of things. I don't want to go into the terrain of my other two colleagues. They will dip in some of these that I'm introducing, you know. But it is important that while engaging the patient, you have, you know, to take the patient into confidence, to build a reversible or uh, to build a reversible confidence such that the two of you will be on the same page. When you are on the same page, then some of the things that are necessary, that are tools for your own use, you know, will be, will be given to you. What, why you are doing that is because you are preventing a future bias in your reportage. You are starting by having him, you know, in, into confidence. Once you have his confidence, then there are other micro, you know, processes that should also, you know, follow upon uh, acceptance of mutual confidence. Why we are doing this is because any decision 
about drug use must be acceptable to both the provider and the you know, beneficiary. In other words, once the two of you agree, it is no more compliance. It has become adherence. Because the two of you have each other's confidence in arriving at the modus operandi. It is only when such has been established that your reports, your future reports, which is expected to come by way of a clinical report or case study, will now be uh, without or with minimal bias. Uh, there are, like I said, a lot of components, you know, many components of some of these attributes. Uh, I'm sure my time is uh, running out. Moderator, how much time do I have? <laughs> Madam Moderator, um, how much time do I have? Do I have two minutes? Yes, we, we can give you a few, like, Hello, ma'am. Yes, sir. When? I think we can take two more minutes, sir. Okay. So, uh, th there are cautions, even to ourselves and to our colleagues. When, when you read a journal, a case report, a case study, anything that does not have ingredients, that lend to understanding, you know, I think you should just, you know, advance your search, abandon it and search further. Because if the author did not follow some of the aforesaid procedure, then there is a problem. You, you are not likely to get a useful, uh, you know, information or useful information that will address all your queries. What does that mean, you know, do I mean by this? One, the, the systematics should be such that it will form a template, so that if you have a live scenario and you put it on this template, all the questions should be answered. For instance, it starts with the interaction with the patient or group of patients. Because eventually, this is the, uh, a, a sort of understanding of the foundation for the next stage, which is clinical trial. Because if we don't know how to write reports, it will rubbish whatever efforts that we think we might have put you know, into the, into, the, into the study. So we are taking two things, you know, simultaneously. The ingredients of information and the formation or the writing up of a respectable, readable, and uh, a, a report that can pass knowledge. So uh, if I have an opportunity, I may have a recap after my two colleagues, you know, have spoken because we will find some of these ingredients, you know, in their presentation as they come in the next uh, few minutes. So, uh, the interrogation of the patients will bring out the patient's uh, risk or possible risk of adverse events from the drug, which is central to any pharmacies, whether in the community, in the hospital, or anywhere. All this as it applies to us as clinical pharmacies, it's also apply, you know, to medics or clinicians, or medical clinicians, or I don't know what name they are called now. Okay? Now, when we assess that is 
it will listen about them. So everything that we talk about the backtracking are ingredients of interrogation. And it's only when you get all this that you can now be able to help the patient. I think I will pause here for the other colleagues so that I don't talk, uh, I don't say what they are supposed to say. Okay, moderator, over to you. Thank you very much, sir. We um, really appreciate um, your lecture and um, it has been extremely informative to us. Thank you once again. Our next speaker is Pharmacist Ibrahim Abbas. Welcome you, sir. Over to you. Welcome, Pharmacist Dr. Um, Dr. Lawal. Good evening to you all. Uh, just as uh, Prof, Prof, uh, Prof uh, rightly highlighted, uh, one of the key role of the pharmacy, and of course, when you are going to provide drug information as an expert in the field, uh, you must be seen to be professional in doing that. Uh, before uh, uh, I go in details, I, I want to quickly run down uh, the systematic approach that uh, you need to apply okay, when you are going to provide drug information. The first you need to do uh, is to get the requester's demographics. Uh, you need to know if the requester is a pharmacist. You need to know if the requester is a physician or a patient. Of course, you also need to know if this information is for policy making. And so this uh, gives you an opportunity on how to uh, channel your search. Secondly, you obtain uh, a background information. That is, if uh, the requester is a patient, just as Prof rightly said, uh, you need to know the age, uh, you need to know the sex, you need to get uh, a, a general knowledge about this patient. You need contact from this uh, patient. Uh, after getting all this, of course, the next line of action will be to determine or categorize the question. Of course, this will further help in streamlining uh, our focus to specific resources. That is, you need to classify the request. Is this request for adverse drug reaction? Is it request uh, for formulation or compounding of drug? Is it request on alternative medicine? You want to know. After all this, you come up with a search strategy and conduct a search for the information. You need to know where to begin your search. There are three sources of information they are categorized as primary, secondary, and tertiary. Of course, primary source is the most reliable source of information. This has to do with original researches that are conducted by other researchers. After this stage, you go into evaluation and analysis of your information. You need to synthesize the information that you have gotten uh, as a response. You need to know if this information is accurate and up to date. Uh, you need to know uh, how old is this information at your disposal? Because the most current information is preferred. And that is why it is uh, more reliable that you contact uh, the primary sources. After this, you can then give a response. 
uh, to the requester, you do a follow up and documentation. As Prof rightly said, if it's not documented, it is not done. In fact, this speaks a lot to your credibility as a professional. Now, in appraising a clinical journal or any other source of uh, material that you are using to get uh, your response to a question or drug information that is requested from you. There are various sections of every research work. You have the title, you have the author's list, you have abstract, you have introduction, you have methodology, you have result, you have conclusion, and so on. But there are areas that uh, you should dwell on. First and foremost, you look at the title of uh, the work. Does the title clearly communicate the study, the study's content? Does it give you a clearer picture of what the work is all about? If yes, then you proceed to the author's list. You want to look at the researchers. Are they credible? Do they have the capacity to carry out this research? You want to know this. Then the next section that is also very important you look at, you look at the introduction. Is the, is the list, You don't have to spend more time on it. But of course, there are questions you must also ask yourself to see if the introduction provides answer to these questions. You want to know if the author have reviewed relevant background literature. You also want to know if the trial is original. Did the author do their homework? before starting it. What clinical question is the trial trying to address? Of course, there are questions that could also arise from this angle. Who, who is the patient? What was the, who is the patient? What was the intervention? What was the control and what was the primary outcome? These are questions that the introductory parts will need to answer. Now, the most important section in reviewing this material is the methodology. You want to know how scientific is the methodology. Could a reader accurately reproduce the trial from the paper? You may not reproduce this exactly the same, but is it logical enough? Is it scientific? Is it something that you can, you can flow through easily? These are what you watch out for in the method. You also need to watch out for the study subjects. How were they recruited? What were the exclusion criteria? This is very important because some potential subjects may be systematically excluded. And this could affect the overall results. It can also affect the credibility of the results or the outcome of this research. You also want to look at how large is the sample size and what is the sample size calculated ahead of time. The problem with inadequate size is that it reduces the ability of the research to demonstrate its benefits. This is also determined by the power of the research. You also want to know if the trial 
is controlled. What was the control? Any trial that lacks control is going to have very limited application. You can imagine uh, a trial that is carried out without a control. Of course, that a trial is carried out without control does not invalidate it, but it, it speaks a lot about the applicability of such work. When it comes to control, you want to know what kind of control. Is it a placebo control? Is it a simple established treatment control? That is, is the research group compared to an established treatment that is already in existence? Is it compared to a placebo group Is it compared to a conventional treatment? These are areas we need to look at as well. You also need to find out if the trial is randomized. How was it performed? All these are areas that you need to look at when you are assessing uh, and information from uh, a journal or any source that you are trying to get uh, the requester's uh, answer from. You also need to know if uh, the trial is blinded. Is it single blinded or double blinded? These are very important. You also need to find out the endpoint of the research. Is the endpoint objective or subjective? Of course, the essence of blinding a research work is to uh, ensure that there is objectivity in the endpoint. A double-blinded uh, research work guarantees uh, an objective endpoint. That is that about the methodology. Then you go to the results. Of course, there are questions you also need to have at the back of your mind when going through the results, uh, the result uh, section. You want to look at how good was the randomization. That is, where the baseline characteristic difference between the two arms. For example, the intervention arm and the control arm. If the baseline characteristic, say for example, if your uh, sample size calculated is 400, and uh, you have distributed this number to the intervention arm and the control arm, where you have 200 in the intervention arm, and you also have 200 at the control arm, it may not exactly be the same. There are instances that during randomization, you have uh, one of the arms being a little bit more than the other. It is still in order. But what you are looking out for here is uh, a situation where you have the control arm much more than the intervention arm. Uh, this says a lot about the uh, credibility of the outcome of the, of the result. Now, you, 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 you also need to look at uh, the statistical uh, significance, the difference in this, in the frequency of the primary outcome between the intervention and the control arm. What was the dropout rate between the two arms? If the dropout rate in the intervention arm is much more than the control arm, that would also affect uh, the outcome of the research. It is expected that uh, this should be approximately the same. How many people could complete the process? How many people did you start with? And how many people uh, stayed all through? These are things you must watch out for carefully uh, in a research work, 
uh, for you to draw uh, a good conclusion from the result. A very high dropout rate adversely impacts on a trial power. This is why a dropout rate should be considered when calculating sample size for a research. Say, for example, if I have envisaged that uh, out of the 400 participants that I propose to use in a research, I envisage that about 10% of this uh, may not uh, go through the process. It is logical that I put this into consideration. Instead of recruiting 400, it's better I recruit about 450. So that if at the end of the day, I have this number as, uh, as I've envisaged that we're going to drop out, it doesn't really affect my uh, sample size. And if at the end of the day, they all participated to the end of the research work, better, the larger the sample size, the better is the, is the result. Yes. After this, we go into the uh, discussion. Of course, at the discussion, there are questions that should also be at the back of our mind that we ask ourselves. These are questions we need to look at carefully. You want to know if the conclusion follow, follows uh, logically from the result. You also want to know if the author make comparison uh, to the result of similar studies that were carried out in other places. Did the author discuss limitation of their trial, systematic bias, and all? There are no uh, research work that does not have limitation. If your researcher is telling you all went well, there are no limitations, everything went smoothly, it then means that he's not been objective as to uh, the research that he has carried out. So that uh, puts you away from such uh, documents. It's advisable, just as Prof has rightly said, when you ask yourself some of these questions and uh, you are not getting uh, a good response from because in this case, you are speaking to the document, you are speaking to the material before you. If you are not getting answers to these various questions as you assess this document before you, it is better you drop it and uh, head to another uh, research work that you think you could get necessary information that will equip you uh, to give a proper response to what the requester is demanding from you. So this is uh, all I have for you. I'll be waiting for the question and answer section. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mohammed Dawel. 